Good morning. Welcome to the Indian Express Explained. My name is Bhuvan Apoor Vajha, where we seek to understand uh, the major news that comes out of the Express page of Indian Express, as well as take a look at uh, those articles that as a serious civil service aspirant, you ought to have a very serious look at. Okay. So without further ado, let's get started because, well, what's the point of wasting your time? Right. Let's get started. So this is where you go ahead and connect with me, by the way, if you have any particular doubts or any particular query, any particular strategy related guidance that you might so require during the course of your preparation, then you go ahead and connect with me on this Instagram channel. You go ahead and just scan this and become a part of uh, a very small, a very tight knit community where we uh, take a look at questions, doubts, grievances, strategy related issues, all of that. This is where you go ahead and connect with me. Meanwhile, the first topic that I have for you so for those of you who had seen, say, uh, the class yesterday, we discussed in detail about the Panama Canal, yes, and we understood that, well, there is a lack of fresh water, there's a lack of rainfall in uh, the Gatun Lake, okay, which is causing this uh, drop in the water levels of Panama Canal, which is why you find that, say, my uh, a major shipping route is now under stress, okay. But the question so arises, and thankfully so Indian Express has covered it today, that the question so arises, well, why the drought? What has changed? Okay. So this is going to be the agenda of the class, the first class, in fact, the first agenda. Okay. And this is a continuation of, say, what we understood yesterday. So for those of you who have uh, not watched yesterday's class, that is the 18th of October, go ahead and take a look at uh, the first discussion we did, which was to take a look at uh, the Panama Canal and exactly what is going wrong there. Now, in terms of today's discussion, the headline, severe spell of drought in the Amazon. We'll look at the causes, the impact, and well, what's ahead for us. First, class sixth, NCRT geography. Amazon, also known as the lungs of the earth. We'll understand why are they called the lungs of the earth. What is so special about Amazon that say, uh, we are giving them this particular name tag, okay? But more importantly, let's understand <coughs> the other facets, the facts of the case first. Okay, Bulbul and Vaishnavi, good morning, good morning guys, thank you for joining. So let's look at it, it covers nearly 7 million square kilometers, if you just look at this entire expanse of the Amazon rainforest, yes, you understand that well, it is indeed huge area that you're looking at, you know, almost uh, what, the size of Australia, and it stores, well, a huge number of carbon in it. But more importantly, from the examination perspective, so Amazon rainforest related to Amazon and its tributaries. So let's understand, well, which are the major nations through which uh, my Amazon river passes exactly? Okay, let's understand that first or else, well, what's the point? Okay, so I have my Amazon river along with its tributaries, right? And so when you look at the course of the river as to how does it flow across the South American continent, okay? What you find is that, well, firstly, it starts from, say, Peru, okay? We are looking at Peru, then Bolivia, right? What is the other country then? We are looking at Venezuela, Colombia, okay? Venezuela, Colombia. All Narcos fans should be able to understand this very quickly, okay? Peru, Bolivia, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil. These are the major nations through which my Amazon River and its major tributaries pass through, okay? And obviously, its headwater is in the Andes uh, uh, mountain range, okay? So it starts from, say, the Andes mountain ranges, correct? And it goes and drains finally into the Atlantic, right? So if this is the course of my Amazon River, right? Vic, good morning, good morning, welcome. If this is the course of my Amazon River, then let's go ahead and take a look at, say, what exactly is going wrong there. Because it's a very interesting discussion when you go ahead and say factor in a very key geographical concept that we'll seek to understand in this class, right? So the Amazon rainforest, my dear friends, breaking news, reeling from an intense drought, okay? Several rivers, one is obviously the Rio Negro, which has fallen to a record low levels. So what happens when your rivers run dry? Firstly, you are looking at, well, high number of fish and river dolphins, also called as boto in local language. Now they have run out of water, they are dying which means they are contaminating the water supply, correct? 
which means uh, you are also looking at say uh, the population there that is dependent on these rivers now not having access to adequate uh, say levels of water okay and at the same time what you are looking at is because of this dry season that has come into place okay amazon rainforest which means it's supposed to have huge amount of rainfall that's the primary criteria of being a rainforest but in the absence of rainfall you have uh, well wildfires that are now common you also have the practice of well what we understand in india as jhumming you know the slash and burn agriculture that is also practiced there so you have these fires that are put out in fact that are put in place and now they are just you know going from expanding in size so these wildfires are increasing not just in frequency but also the area that they cover and why is that happening well primarily to do with the fact that well this area is not receiving the sufficient amount of rainfall that it should have okay so let's understand the reasons for the drought now this is where the geography starts okay revisit good morning good morning how are you so let's understand the reasons guys two reasons okay very very important from the examination perspective one obviously is to do with what we and uh, you and i both very well know is the phenomenon of el nino okay so we'll understand in this class later exactly how is el nino going and say creating this drought like conditions in uh, the south american especially the amazon basin the whole amazon rainforest area and the second is the unusually high water temperatures in the northern tropical atlantic ocean so two reasons okay when you're looking at el nino and its effect on the amazon uh, rainforest or the amazonia basin there are two reasons that you're looking at one is obviously el nino and the other is the high sea surface temperature of north atlantic ocean okay now for those of you who have gone through say this particular concept well this class will be relatively easy for those of you who have not understood this particular concept in detail don't worry i am going to go ahead and explain to you the facts of the case so let's understand let's go ahead and understand it one by one okay here is your south america north america the whole story is to do with this particular area okay this is the area of our interest the equatorial pacific ocean and at the same time what you're looking at is this particular area which is now warming up okay the northern atlantic ocean roughly this area okay now what do you observe in a normal year guys okay in a normal year what do you expect so you have say these trade winds that are converging from both sides what we commonly know as the easterlies which would go ahead and push my warm water this manner eventually you have the formation of a warm block of uh, water you know it's like a huge pool of warm water that gets formed on the east coast of australia okay which means what happens now two concepts that you need to be aware of very very quickly warm air rises up cold air sinks concept 1 and the second concept that you need to be aware of to understand this concept fully is that well my air moves from high pressure to low pressure that's all you need to know to understand el nino okay so once you understand these two concepts in a normal year what do you expect is that because of this easterlies strengthened you have this warm pacific pool that is formed somewhere near australian coast which means what happens eventually warm air rises up yes you have cloud formation here and then you have precipitation that is observed here now this is in a normal year in a la nina year this whole phenomenon of a normal year that is happening is strengthened which means you have more rainfall here which means you have drier say uh, at drier conditions here now why would that happen guys simple concept when this particular air has moved up rainfall has happened precipitation has happened now exists a cold dry air mass what should happen to that cold dry air mass eventually it seeks to go ahead and dive in the neighboring areas in search of what you can understand moisture so in a normal year this is what you're expecting okay which means obviously because you have dry air that is descending here please tell me which particular desert do i find here is it not the patagonian uh, uh, desert 
Yes, in Peru. So this is what I'm observing, correct? Now in an El Nino year, the exact opposite is observed. In an El Nino year, you see that this particular movement of warm water that should have been happening does not happen to the same strength or the same magnitude, which means exactly what happens, that you are looking at this entire process now getting reversed, right? So you have eventually this warm air mass or this warm water that will be lying somewhere in the central or say it hasn't traveled that west. It hasn't gone that far at all, correct? Now the second factor that I just showed you, okay? Let's look at it, the second factor. The sea surface temperature of Northern Atlantic Ocean is high. It's warmer, which means this particular area is warm. Because of these two functioning together, my friends, what is observed is that here in the Amazon basin, you are looking at rainfall that is deficient. And in the west coast of Australia, sorry, Northern America, which is here somewhere, you are looking at rainfall that is higher. This is the entire concept. Because of El Nino, yes, your rainfall that ideally should have been following here. Well, obviously, say, say, say the southern part of South America does receive rainfall, but because of a warm Atlantic Ocean and El Nino in operation, you are experiencing drought-like conditions in this area. Correct? So this is the entire concept in a gist. Okay? Obviously, El Nino is a huge concept. When you go ahead and understand, say, the uh, mechanisms of El Nino, this Walker cell circulation that I'm explaining before you, you see that it is directly linked to the strength of the Indian monsoons. So now you might be considering how? Well, should I take your word for it? Not at all. Let me go ahead and explain it to you in five minutes or less. So how does it go ahead and influence my Indian monsoon? Okay, let's go ahead and do it point by point. Number one, here is your warm water blob. Okay, in a normal year, your Western Pacific pool forms here, correct? Which means you have low pressure, warm air, low pressure. So the warm air rises up once again, cloud formation, rainfall over Australia, huge rainfall over Australia. Now, like I told you, once the air has lost its moisture, it seeks to dive, which means this warm, this cold air, one part dives here, the other part dives somewhere near Madagascar Island, okay, which an area that we know as the Mascarene High, okay. Now, because you have cold air diving here, you have high pressure systems that develop here, which is why Mascarene High. Now, once you have this high pressure system develop here, please understand that the thermocline now exists. And because of this, you have upwelling of cold water off the coast of South America, just near Peru. This cold water, nutrient rich water that has come up, brings with itself lots of nutrients, lots of fish, and then environmental concepts come into play. Because there are lots of fish, obviously fishermen go ahead and make a whole killing out of the whole uh, fisheries industry. But at the same time, you also are looking at a particular bird species that goes and eats these fishes. And then the excreta of that fish, excreta of that bird is used to propel the fertilizer industry in Southern America. Correct? Now, coming to the Indian Ocean. Because of cold air that has dived here, yes, your mascarine high is now strengthened. And the more your mascarine high is strengthened, the more, well, it's the basic character of high pressure systems, guys. Like I told you, air moves from high pressure to low pressure. If your high pressure system is strengthened, which means that this entire area sees air moving out, diverging from here, branching out from here. And thus you find that after hitting the Horn of Africa, crossing the equator, Coriolis force into effect, and thus it helps push my monsoonal winds deeper, faster into Indian uh, subcontinent. So this is what you would expect in a normal year. But in an El Nino year, what changes? Well, the same concept. And now please understand this. In geography, it's not something that we are discussing as an absolute concept. No. Geography, everything is relative. 
So, as compared to a normal year, what changes in an El Nino year? Well, here you have your warm Pacific pool that is not as strong as a normal year. Please uh, focus on the words that I'm choosing. I choose my words very carefully. Okay. My warm Pacific pool, the western Pacific pool that forms off the coast of Australia, is not as much in magnitude and quantity as in a normal year. Which means your low pressure system is now lesser. Correct? Which means your high pressure system here is, well, obviously lesser. Your high pressure system at masquerine high is lesser. Because of this, can you understand that if my high pressure system at masquerine high is now less in magnitude, the winds that go out from there are no longer carrying the same strength as a normal year. Which means eventually, this entire process of hitting the coast of uh, the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, all of those nations, that wind that is going and hitting that landmass is now lesser in speed, in strength. And thus you find that the monsoonal winds that should have been coming at increased frequency and speed into the Indian subcontinent are now pulled back. And thus you find that, well, El Nino causes drought in India. This is the entire concept of El Nino and La Nina. They are very basic concepts. But the effects of these global systems are profound. Okay. So here, coming back to the discussion that I was telling you about, because of these phenomenon, yes, because of this phenomenon, what you're observing is that here in my Southern America, the north part of Southern America, I'm essentially looking at rainfall now that is deficient. Please bear in mind that my Atlantic Ocean is also warmer now. The sea surface temperature is higher. And thus you find that my west coast of USA, a desert here, the Sierra Nevada desert, you find that it is receiving rainfall. That rainfall that was actually supposed to go ahead and fall on my Amazon rainforest. Thus you find that my rivers now are drying up here. Thus you find that wildfires are happening. Thus you find that people do not have access to fresh water. And more importantly, the scope of the discussion today, that Amazon rainforest, the lungs of the world, they do not have the amount of rainfall that they need to survive and say stabilize the ecosystem that they are in. Correct? So this is essentially causing a huge amount of rainfall deficit in this particular area. Now in yesterday's discussion, if you remember, we discussed the Panama Canal here, which is again bearing the brunt of this entire thing. Because you do not have rainfall in this area, my Gatun Lake or my Mira Flores Lake, yes, the two main lakes that feed my uh, Panama Canal, now they do not have the fresh water. And thus you find that my containers or my shipping industry, yes, container shipping industry is adversely affected. Yesterday we took a, took a look at the alternatives now that are being developed to the Panama Canal. Yes, why is that happening? Well, eventually it is to do with the fact that climate change, the more you go ahead and emit GHGs, the more the frequency and the strength of El Nino in the coming years becomes, well, higher. Say, if 10 years ago, El Nino was happening, say, once in seven years. Now what you're experiencing is, as a result of this increased emissions of the greenhouse gases, your time period or the frequency of El Nino is now getting shorter. Earlier, once in seven years, now in once in three years, four years, even two years. Which means this particular ecosystem, the Amazon rainforest, is under huge stress. Not just, say, the shipping industry, which is a minor part of this entire discussion, but more importantly, my Amazon rainforest is experiencing drought-like symptoms. Correct? Because of this, my friends, what you're observing is the facts that I told you about. Have a look at this, the Walker cell circulation that I just told you, okay? From the west, El Nino, which warms water in the Pacific near the equator is gaining strength. Thus you find that in my Southern American continent, you are receiving drought-like conditions, okay? Most of the rainfall is either happening in the middle of the sea or towards Australia, correct? Or say, north of the Pacific, correct? Not exactly over the landmass you can roughly understand it as a strengthened El Nino Modoki, okay? where the rainfall is being experienced in the central Pacific Ocean. The rainfall that was meant for the Amazon rainforest 
is not being received by the Amazon rainforest. The second reason, from the southwest, high temperatures in the North Atlantic waters have accelerated the airflow towards Amazon, thus no rain clouds. If you do not have rain clouds, if you do not have that entire process of warm air rising, eventually cloud formation and precipitation, well then what's the point? Where is the rain going to come from? Correct? This is the entire concept as to why Amazon rainforests are under severe drought-like conditions. Okay? If you have any particular doubts, feel free to ask me by the way. So look at this now. Amazon rainforest, the lungs of the earth. Why exactly? How do we go ahead and classify them as the lungs of the earth? Okay, six standard NCRT geography by the way. Number one, home to 10% of all known wildlife species in the world. In fact, endemic species. They are a characteristic of Amazon rainforests, right? You're looking at specific varieties of monkeys, birds, cinchona. Yes, cinchona from which you go ahead, make Queen in. Can someone tell me very quickly, those of you who are watching me live, which disease do I use quinine to uh, like help me with the disease? What is the use of quinine medicinally? Let me know very quickly. Right? So, cinchona forests of Amazon, once again being threatened. The human uh, aspect, you are well aware of. Okay? 40,000 different plant species, individual trees. 20% of the world's oxygen. So if you take five deep breaths, okay, chances are that you have taken one deep breath that has come out from the Amazon rainforest. Imagine what happens if this entire forested area is now threatened because of drought-like conditions. Okay, Alarm bells have already started ringing, by the way, in terms of the profound effects that this will have, not just in the ecosystem of South America and North America. That's a very myopic viewpoint, you know. In terms of the, uh, the, the significance of Amazon rainforest uh, experiencing drought-like conditions, please understand the effects will be global. For example, I told you that our Indian monsoons are related to this movement of water that starts from, say, starts from here, comes up till here, then you have your mascarine high, and then you have your Indian, Indian monsoons. So you realize this, that our monsoonal winds are related to the temperatures that exist in the Pacific Ocean. Imagine if this temperature is variable, which means obviously your monsoonal rainfall over India will also be variable. Now you know that we are an agrocentric economy. Yes, we have our own projects running and most of us are, in fact, the most of the sectors are dependent on a good rainfall. Now, because of this happening, please understand, that the effects are not just limited to, say, the Amazon rainforest. Yes, obviously, this is going to bear the primary brunt. Yes, but the loss of Amazon rainforests will not just affect the area here, but the entire world. 20% of the world's oxygen coming from the Amazon rainforest. They store 150 million uh, tons of carbon uh, in them. What happens if that carbon is released? Yes, you are well intelligent to figure that out yourself. Correct Vaishnavi, anti-malarial drug, you're absolutely bang on. Right? Let's look at the other factors. 70% of plants known to have anti-cancer properties, water cycle is being maintained there. These are the effects and in fact, the point of this entire slide is to provide you with fodder points. Yes, these are the fodder points. For example, if the question asks you, what is the significance of Amazon rainforest? Bring out the effects of El Nino insofar as the viability of Amazon rainforest in global ecosystem cycling is concerned. Yes. So you need some particular fodder points to go ahead and write your introduction or in your main answers. These are the main points that you can so consider including. Right. So you understand this, that because not just again, see, the, the various facets of Amazon experiencing El Nino. Let's look at it one by one now. Okay. Let's do it here. The effects of Amazon experiencing El Nino. Okay. So yesterday's class, number one, we looked at shipping. Yes, in terms of my Panama Canal that is now affected. Okay. Now, in terms of my ecologically 
sensitive zone. You are well aware of it. Right? In terms of global weather movements and weather patterns, that is going to be affected. Okay? What are the other facets that you can think of? Let's brainstorm very quickly. Early morning, your brain should be fresh. Go ahead and tell me, what are the other facets that could be affected because of Amazon rainforest experiencing El Nino? You are looking at, well, not just Northern America, but South America, which is a major conversation when it comes to the global South. They are going to have less of fresh water. Yes, the rivers such as Rio Negro drying up. You know, when you go ahead and read the particular article uh, that is published in CNN, you will find that Rio Negro that used to have massive volumes of water is now being reduced to a simple drain or a stream. Yes. So all the endemic species, all the say uh, industries that lie alongside the particular rivers are now affected, which means you're looking at, well, employment, survivability, Yes, the economy of that particular region, all of getting affected. Why? Yes, because your Amazon is experiencing severe drought-like conditions. This is what is expected of you guys. You know, you should quickly brainstorm and generate ideas for yourself when it comes to answering these multifaceted questions. You know, it will be very uh, wrong to say that this is just a weather problem. It is obviously a weather problem for sure. But the effects have to be gone and say analyzed in terms of human impact, economic impact, people to people connections that will be affected, shipping, trade, commerce, international relations. Yes. So off late, you must have remembered that there was a recent meeting, the Amazon Forum. Yes. Where countries went ahead and said, well, how are we going to deal with this particular issue? In fact, the Amazon rainforest was the major election issue when it came to the Brazil elections. One party wanted to go ahead and harness Amazon rainforest for, say, economic benefit. The other party wanted to go ahead and protect Amazon rainforest for posterity, for knowing its ecological significance, right? So all of these are very important and interlinked topics, especially if you get a question on these lines asked in the mains. Correct? Yes, Vaishnavi, forest fires, drought, wildfires, all of that, you can understand. Similarly, it does not mean, so what happens? Your wetter period that you would have expected in Amazon is now lesser. Your dry period, for example, certain plant varieties in the Amazon rainforest are, say, programmed. They have the capability to go ahead and say, withstand dry periods for three to five weeks. No problems. The problem so arises if it goes and becomes eight weeks. Then suddenly you find that all of these plants that had the capability to withstand five weeks of dry period are now perishing, which means your dry period is getting extended. Correct? These are again from the MCQ point of view, exactly what the examination expects you to know. Right? So this is the first topic that I had for you today in terms of Amazon rainforest and the effect that it has while experiencing severe drought-like conditions. Okay, if you understood this discussion, if you understood the various interlinkages that the examination expects you to know, then do consider leaving me a like. It'll really give me a huge motivation early this morning, especially when it's a cold morning like this. Okay, right? Let's look at some questions that I have for you today, my friends. What is the fun without solving questions? Yes, this is the fun part of early morning discussions. Let's look at it. First question. La Nina is suspected to have caused recent floods in Australia. How is La Nina different from El Nino? Yes, UPSC CSE pre-2011 PYQ. So not long ago, just a decade ago, UPSC had gone ahead and asked this question. Let's look at the first option. La Nina is characterized by unusually cold ocean temperature in equatorial Indian Ocean. El Nino characterized by unusually warm ocean temperature in the equatorial Pacific. Second, El Nino has adverse effects on southwest monsoon. La Nina has no effect on monsoons. You will go ahead and identify the correct statements for me. And the second question around Enzo. Okay. Enzo, a period, periodic fluctuation in sea surface temperatures and air pressure of the atmosphere across Atlantic. El Nino events represent periods of below average sea surface temperature across east to central equatorial Pacific. All I expect you to do is 
look at this particular map and the questions shall follow quite easily. It's not rocket science guys. Geography is probably the most scientific of all of the subjects that you will be learning in terms of your UPSC prep. Okay. So go ahead and identify the correct statements for me. Leave your answers for me in the comment box and any particular feedback that you have for me. I'd most appreciate it. Right before we go forward very quickly, this uh, GS Foundation P2I course, 20th, in fact, 23rd of October, morning batch, 8 a.m. And uh, so anyone who's preparing for, say, next year or the year after that, if you understand the way we go ahead and uh, understand concepts here, discuss concepts here, the primary focus of the entire establishment here at Study IQ IAS is to make sure that our students have the ability to solve questions, that the concepts need to be crystal clear, okay? And so this is the primary focus. If you understand, if you resonate with that particular way, go ahead, quickly sign up for this. More importantly, because you have extended periods of validity, yes, you can start preparing for, say, the year after next right now, right? You need not wait for, say, next year, March, we will start studying in What's the point? The earlier you start, the more advantage you give yourself in terms of a highly competitive examination as the civil services examination, right? So go ahead and sign up for this course. Look at the course deliverables. More importantly, if you have any particular doubts, reach out to me on my Instagram channel. I'll be happy to help you with any particular doubts that you might have. And once you do decide to sign up, use the code BA Live. Why? Because, well, firstly, you and I start studying geography together, environment together, international relations and CSAT. And uh, my other esteemed colleagues here will take a look at the other subjects for you. Okay. So, well, the time is running out. In fact, I was having a chat with the course coordinator just last evening and he told me that, well, we have what, not more than 20, 25 seats left. So, if you are one of those who'd like to get associated with this particular program, go ahead and join ASAP. And why I'm telling you the 20, 25 seats, by the way, you know. So, ideally, in other institutions, I'm not going to name any, what you find is that it's almost like a matinee show, you know, 500 students in one class. How is one going to address, even ask a doubt or get a doubt resolved? So here we have short batches, small batches, limited number of students to facilitate better exchange of ideas. The learning has to be in a small controlled environment. You can't have an unstable environment and expect that a student will ask questions and get their doubts cleared. And it's not even possible for a teacher to do so, right? So this is the entire thrust of this entire course. Make sure that you sign up for this ASAP. Right, second topic that I have for you, my friends. China's Belt and Road Initiative is changing. Guess what? All the topics that we have been discussing so far, that well, China's Belt and Road Initiative is unsustainable, that this particular uh, strategy that they have of what you can understand as economic domination, now it is backfiring on China. Okay. Just the 10th anniversary of uh, BRI was observed, I think, yesterday or the uh, day before yesterday. And so you had the Chinese emperor come and address and say, then claim. And uh, essentially, well, he addressed and gave a direct threat to the rest of the world that do not decouple from China. Okay. Do not decouple from China. This concept of decoupling needs to be understood in short. After COVID-19 pandemic, what you find is nations are now looking at China with a lot of mistrust, okay? Forget that probably they were the source of the virus. We are not going to get into that political debate. More importantly, what countries are now realizing is that China is not a sustainable, trustworthy supply chain partner. Which is why now you are looking at, say, the other countries in and around China that have created their own ecosystems. India, thankfully, too, is one of them. We have our Make in India that started in 2014, Atman Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. All of these makes India a prime viable candidate to be a replacement part, replacement of the global supply chain part in place of China. Right. So let's look at the Belt and Road Initiative now. Chinese companies build transportation, energy, infrastructure. And guess what? Where are they getting their money from? Chinese developmental bank loans. The key word that you should focus, loans. Now, the terms of these loans are vague, okay? In fact, you have the Chinese uh, government that goes and gives, gives this loan to these, uh, say, poor aspirational countries, knowing fully well that they will be unable to pay. Thus, you have the prime example of a port in Sri Lanka 
that Chinese have managed to get on a 99 year old lease. Yes. Why has that happened? Well, because Chinese knew that Sri Lanka will be unable to pay that huge amount of sum and thus they go ahead and use this particular Belt and Road Initiative to further their geopolitical interests across the Indian Ocean realm. Correct. Now, when you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, there are varied amount of facets to it. Two important parts that you need to be aware of. One is the Land Road Initiative and the next is the Maritime uh, uh, maritime Silk Route. Okay. So, let's look at it one by one. <clears throat> the goal was to grow trade and economy. This is what they claimed by the way. That we will further integrate ourselves with the rest of the world. Now, please understand this. We'll go back to the map again. Because what better way to understand a concept than through a map? Okay. Let's look at it. This is where China is right now. Okay. This is my China. Now, please understand this. From the western side, it is almost well, fully landlocked. And from the eastern side, you have the presence of Japan here. And then you have important straits, the Malacca Strait. Okay. The South China Sea. All of these are areas of geopolitical tensions. Right. So, China recognizes that it needs to build connectivity to the rest of the world through this area as well as to make sure that it has good presence in the Indian Ocean realm. Only then will it be able to go ahead and fortify its own, say, future against any particular geopolitical realities that might so uh, arise in the near future. This was the primary motivation to give yourself this ample space to make sure that you are able to go and integrate with the world. But in that process, the Chinese companies realized that, well, why just limit ourselves to going and connecting to trade and commerce, right? When you can also go ahead and use the money to illegitimately go ahead and get land for yourself, projects for yourself, key areas, strategic areas for yourself. And this is where the grievance of the whole world comes in. So, for example, today I told you that China has got itself a port here. Yes, Hamban Tota port. Right? Chinese vessels frequently are found in this particular area. Frequently, in fact. Yes? Chinese have invested in Indonesia. The Indonesian president said that, well, it's financially not viable for us, the terms of engagement that China is offering us. By, by now, the countries realize that this model of Chinese to give you easy loans, which might seem easy at first, but is definitely not easy because you are not going to be able to pay back that sum at the rate of interests or the terms and conditions that are put forward by the Chinese. Impossible to do that. Right? So that realization has now set in. And at the same time, what you find is that well, countries are now looking at transitioning to net zero. Yes, different countries have different uh, years of target. India, for example, 2070. Yes, USA 2050. European Union. All of them have, say, other uh, nations have their net zero target emissions by the particular date. But Chinese companies are more dependent on coal. Thus, what you find is that the change in the Chinese thought process is now coming through. Okay, let's look at it. BRI is now looking to become smaller and greener. Yes, no, not much money is now going to be given by the Chinese. Why? Because, well, the goodwill is being lost. And because now nations are looking to transition towards a cleaner, greener economy, the Chinese companies, the Chinese developmental model, which is coal-centric, uh, hasn't got many buyers in the market. Okay. Thus, countries have big debts and environmental concerns. Both of these have led China to recalibrate as to how it should go ahead and uh, well, recalibrate its Belt and Road Initiative. So here, I, like I told you, the two particular uh, trade routes, the land route as well as the sea route. Okay. So, in the past, when we were discussing, say, the Xinjiang human rights abuse, okay, that, say, people of Xinjiang, the Muslims of Xinjiang are, well, say, being cynicized, yes, that they are now getting reformed in the, well, reformed is a very polite term, but they are getting reformed in the Chinese thought process. Well, one part is obviously China's mistrust of the people, but more importantly, what you realize is that Xinjiang here, is an area which is petro rich plus it gives you a corridor to go ahead and connect with Europe. You have railway connectivity that is there. 
which is why you find that China's actions, its human rights abuses are also linked to its ambitions in trade and commerce. We hear about the string of pearls. Many students would have heard of that. While it is obviously a byproduct, its entire aim is to say circle the Indian Ocean realm. Yes. But more importantly, it's also to go ahead and give China the security it needs for its oil vessels, for its merchant vessels, as they look to go ahead and traverse strategic choke points, such as the Strait of Malacca, the Gulf of Bengal, yes, the Red Sea. All of these are strategic choke points. So, for example, very quickly, if I were to tell you about what are strategic choke points, think of the 71 war. Yes, let's think of the 71 war and you'll get this concept the best way. So, you had Indian Navy that went ahead and carried out a blockade insofar as the Pakistan border was concerned. What was the point of this? Eventually, to make sure that Pakistan was choked of fuel imports. If you do not have oil, what war are you going to fight? This is the entire problem that China wants to avoid. More so because, again, Belt and Road Initiative is linked to China's economic health. Correct? So once again, a topic that requires a little bit of interlinkage in terms of, well, China's global ambitions, as well as the realities now that confront it, given that countries know that China's debt, China's loans are bad debt. Chinese investment is not sustainable. Best example again. Yes, best example to understand this, when we were discussing Panama Canal yesterday. Yes, one of the alternatives that we discussed was the Nicaragua Canal. Yes which was again to be built through Chinese assistance. Guess what happened to the Nicar Nicaragua Canal? It got shelved. In fact, got cancelled. Why? Once again, Nicaragua realized that it is not financially feasible to go ahead and engage with the Chinese because again, you are looking at your country that you are going to put as a collateral in the hands of the Chinese. Right? So this is the entire uh, uh, scope of the discussion around BRI. Very quickly, let's understand the Indian position here. Vaishnavi, uh, well, that is not to do with, say, uh, the developmental model that the Chinese follow, obviously. Okay. Countries that have huge debts, it's often seen that it is a historical problem that they've carried through. In terms of USA, for example, Vaishnavi, since you ask it, don't you realize that here is a country that has gone ahead and engaged in multiple wars? Yes, Vaishnavi, will you agree that when it comes to the Chinese and when it comes to the USA, United States and China, both have very different approaches. In spite of, say, hostilities that existed between China and India, not a single bullet has been fired so far. Whereas USA is more than happy to go guns out blazing in any particular, uh, 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 say, any particular confrontation or crisis. Take, for example, the Israel-Palestine crisis that is developing. USA is seeking to play a major role, right? So that is one of the key reasons, in fact, as to why you find that countries like USA are under debt. That in instead of investing in their own population, their outlook and approach is outwards. Whereas in terms of the Chinese approach, the Chinese approach is inwards. Yes, they seek to save every rupee or yuan as their currencies. Every rupee has to be saved for Chinese progress, which is the direct opposite of the United States' motive. That's one of the reasons, Vaishnavi. There are several others, which I can, uh, I think we should do a uh, detailed discussion on that too. It's a very good question. Right. Let's look at the Indian position very quickly. India opposes the project on the grounds of sovereignty, transparency. Obviously, you have POK through which CPEC is supposed to pass through. Yes. Now that is also under, uh, uh, you know, hoga nahi hoga, kisi ko nahi pata, why? The terrain is difficult, political instability in Pakistan. China has already made investments in Pakistan. It finds there are no returns to it. Yes. So this is the Indian position. India always expects that these particular developmental models should respect the rule of the law, the rule-based system that India talks about. Yes. This has to be respected. China doesn't care about all of this. Which is why you find that India has gone ahead and gravitated towards the G7 and their PGII, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. India is not a part of the BRI precisely for this very reason. Correct? Right? Very quickly, answer these questions for me, my friends. How many of the above are a part of China's Maritime Silk Road, South China Sea, Strait of Malacca, Gulf of Bengal, Red Sea? I think we discussed it. Yes. If you're following my lecture very carefully, 
you will see that my answers are provided by me to you. All I expect you to do is listen very, very carefully. Have an attention span of a civil servant, civil servant in waiting. You know, you can't have an attention span of a butterfly and then expect to become a civil servant. That's not going to work. Okay. And Gulf of Aqaba lies between what? Iran and Oman, Yemen and Somalia, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Or if I just make it easy for you, the Sinai Peninsula. Let me know which is the answer here. Okay. Right. This uh, is it for today. Join me on my Telegram channel to find the PDF of this entire lecture. Let's look at the questions of yesterday. In which state of India will you find the Theri Desert? Well, Theri Desert is to do with, if this is my coast of India, you have southwest monsoons that come in. They go ahead. Lot of erosion happening, deposition here. Thus you find the Theri Desert is found here in the state of Tamil Nadu. Okay. Sea grass, coral reefs, mangroves, seaweed. I had asked you which of them is a plant, which of them is an algae. All of you answered correctly. Well done, by the way. You know, that is all you're expected to know. The differences. Okay. So, in terms of Gulf of Manar, Park Strait, all four are found here. No problems whatsoever. It's also a marine national park. Use of Panama Canal helps avoid the long route around Cape of Horn. Okay. Cape of Good Hope is South Africa, by the way. Cape of Horn is South America. Okay. And the Northern Sea Route is an alternative to Panama Canal. In fact, it's the North Western Sea Route. The Northern Sea Route is the one above Russia. The Eastern Economic Framework, where it is looking to connect this entire area, Laptev Sea, Baltic, uh, 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 Chukchi Sea, Kara Sea, that entire area is the Northern Passage. When you go from Greenland, Alaska, that is the North Western Passage. So here, the incorrect statements being both. Gatun Lake, Miraflores Lake, Huron Lake, Great Save Lake. How many of the above are a part of the Can Panama Canal project? Just the first two. Okay. Only two. Israel is bordered by, well, which countries? Correct. Correct. Both. Okay. And this was obviously, we discussed it in the que uh, 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 question yesterday. Syria, Jordan, Turkey, Israel. Which of them shares border with Golan Heights? All except Jordan. It's A, C and D. Right? So my individuals who are answering correctly, Pooja, Vignesh, Ankita, Harshit, Niraja, Tanvi, Pranjul, Anadi, Vaishnavi, Koda, Karuna, Lekam. Lekam, I will respond to your email ASAP. Just give me a little bit of time. Ayush, well done. Rahul, Akshay, Subhadeep, Gangesh and Target CSE. Well done guys. To the rest of you, please answer. Every day I request you to answer these questions for me. Today also, I will put forward my request for you. Go ahead and answer the questions that I have for you. If you have any doubts related to the two topics that we discussed today, feel free to reach out to me on my Instagram handle. With that, we will conclude this discussion. I will see you tomorrow morning in uh, the next edition of Indian Express Explained, where we take a look not just at the Explained page, but also articles that matter. Okay, You need to have conceptual clarity in topics so that you can answer not just MCQs, but mains related questions too. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Have a wonderful day.